For the last few years, we've shed many tears living through a recession. The economy's broken, it's not a joke, when we talk of another depression. 15 million without a job, foreclosures in banks that fail, 401ks became 200, 201ks, and everything's up for sale. How can it be, what didn't we see, that led to all of this trouble? There's little doubt that the proximal cause was a bursting housing bubble. But other than that, who can we blame and what do they lament? Millions of people contributed to this 100-year event. For me, it began in 76 with a house on Cleveland Road. At 54,000, I thought it a lot for a small three-bedroom abode. But 10 years later, that very same house would sell for four times the price. I was glad that I bought. I remember the thought, this may not be fair, but it's nice. <laughs> In Boston alone, that boom created $100 billion in wealth. We spent more, saved less, and I have to confess, it was good for our mental health. You had to know that it couldn't go on. Someday prices would fall. We knew there were risks to ourselves and our fists if those prices were ever to stall. Now, here's what goes to the chart. The left-hand side of that chart is 2000, 2001. It all began in 2001, 9-11, the dot-com bubble. The Fed had to act because of the fact a recession would mean big trouble. So the Fed funds rate sitting just below eight was cut to under two. That's the yellow line. Starts about six and a half there. It was actually up closer to eight. It fell down and it's measured on the, on the right hand scale. So it's, it's, you can see the incredible, expand, the incredible drop of interest rates. So the Fed funds rate sitting just below eight was cut to under two, and you had to know with rates that low, a refi boom would ensue. The volume of mortgages written back then stunned imaginations. In a single quarter in 2003, a trillion in originations. But something happened late that year that caused long rates to rise, and that was the end of the refi boom. It came as quite a surprise, and you can see that get to the third quarter of 2003, and that tall blue bar, which is a trillion dollars, in the quarter, not at annual rates, but in the quarter, trillion dollars in new mortgage originations, mostly refis, um, dropped, and, and dropped by more than 50%. So let me just read that last one, say, a, a in a single quarter in 2003, a trillion in originations, but something happened late that year that caused long rates to rise, and that was the end of the refi boom. It came as quite a surprise. With refis gone, so were big fees, but the banks still had money to lend, and the search for buyers to fill up the gap seemingly had no end. The Fed kept pumping through 2005 to keep short rates very low, and Greenspan gets a share of the blame. His halo has lost some blow. Of course, the key for all to see was a robust housing market. Buyers could borrow lots of cash, and a house was a great place to park it. A summer home no big, and a new big house, no one seemed to care. Homes were made of bricks and land. The value would always be there. It didn't matter what rate you paid or what you made in a year. For a while, liquidity led to stupidity. Just sign and see the cashier. High LTVs and option arms, negative AMs and more. 228s with teaser rates and ridiculous FICO scores. Competition was the force that made the music play. As long as prices didn't fall, everything was okay. People could always sell their house for more than they had paid. Defaults and foreclosures stayed very low, and lots of money was made. Fannie and Fred were always ahead. Then Countrywide got in the fray. Then Lehman and Merrill, Lehman and Merrill and Goldman Sachs couldn't be kept away. You can guess that MBS helped make the trading brisk. Investors thought that the paper they bought was tranched with well-measured risk. To that add leverage and default swaps and when ha then house prices fell, smart guys got hosed and the risks were exposed and that was the closing bell. Now where do we go? We really don't know. We've never been here before. Only time will tell when the markets will clear and prices will fall no more. Some of the data suggests a bottom, while other data conflicts. 
Houses are selling at rates not seen since back in 2006. The inventory of unsold homes is down and no longer grows. But we're not building any new homes. Starts are at 50-year lows. A number of problems remain as risks as the markets begin to turn. The number of loans that still need to be marked is making stomachs churn. 15 million who want to work don't have jobs today, and slow is the pipeline of loans in default, since no one wants to pay. It could also be that the pickup we see is just from government red. Lower rates and tax rebates buying paper from Fannie and Fred. All have certainly played a role, and only time will tell what will happen when they're withdrawn. Still empty units to sell. So now we come to the end of this ode, thank God. <laughs> Without much to say for certain. I hate to say, but that's where we are, not beginning our final curtain. The truth of the matter is that the, the truth of the matter at the end of the day is that markets will make you humble. Just when you think it's time for a drink, they will turn and fortunes will crumble. That free markets work to provide what we want is a notion that's not in dispute. The problem is that once in a while, markets overshoot. Of course, there's greed and there's a need for moral hazard and rules, but you're damned if you do and damned if you don't to be pure is a game for fools. Politicians, of course, are starting to shout that they want more retribution. It's better, I think, to use their time helping to find a solution. <laughs>